every nation has its history of violence and rebellion. Well, today we're going to take a look at medieval England. Yep, we're talking about the time of honorable knights and lords that most of us have often regarded as honor bound to the king and their oaths of fealty. Well, even these guys had their lows, and one such incident is the Barons' War. So today, we're going to give you guys a look into how the events unfolded. Let's get started. Before we get into the events of the war, it's important that we look at the sequence of events that led to this conflict. After all, why would somebody just rise against the rightful king? So a couple of decades back, King John had been forced to fight against his lords in the First Barons' War, who were being supported by the French. During the conflict, King John had died, and his son King Henry III had come to the throne. The war had resulted in a French defeat, with most of the barons or lords being pardoned by the English crown. With order restored, it looks like the king would be able to rule peacefully now, but future events would prove this statement wrong. The reign of King Henry III is most remembered for its constitutional crisis and period of civil strife motivated by discontent English barons. One of these barons was Simon de Montfort. He was born in France and had inherited the title Earl of Leicester through his mother. In the beginning, he was hated by many lords due to his French heritage. His relationship with the king wasn't on the best of terms as he had married Henry's sister Eleanor without his permission and without the agreement of other barons. This was then a condition as it was considered a matter of the state. As a result, a feud developed between the king and de Montfort. The relation was at its lowest when de Montfort was put on trial in the 1250s for the actions he had taken as Lieutenant of Gascony, the last remaining royal land across the English Channel. At the same time, anti-Semitism and general discontent with the policies of the king were rising. The church had been propagating anti-Judaic measures, coupled with rising debts among the barons, gave an opportunity to de Montfort to increase his influence among the affected group, and he would later call for the cancellation of all Jewish debts. In addition to this, the king had embroiled himself in a pointless conflict against the Hohenstaufen dynasty in Sicily on behalf of Pope Innocent IV. This action made many barons fearful that Henry III was following in the footsteps of his father, who had also lost much to foreign wars. De Montfort now began working on barons, who wanted to restore the Magna Carta, an agreement that increased the power of the barons and put limitations on the influence of the crown. It also limited the amount of feudal taxes. After gaining their support, de Montfort would motivate seven leading barons to force Henry to agree to the provisions of Oxford, which effectively ended the absolutist Anglo-Norman monarchy and gave power to a council of 24 barons who would be the ones dealing with the business of the state. Henry was even forced to take part in the swearing of a collective oath to uphold the provisions. Now weakened, Henry looked at potential changes to increase his power and found one such way by purchasing the support of King Louis IX of France by signing the Treaty of Paris. According to this treaty, King Henry accepted the loss of lands in France that had already been lost to him and his father in preceding wars. In 1261, he obtained a papal bull which released him from his oath to uphold the provisions. Now free of all restriction, Henry set about reasserting his authority. The barons responded by summoning their own parliament and contesting control of the local government, but with civil war in sight, most of them backed down and de Montfort was forced to flee to France, while other barons, like Richard de Clare, the Earl of Hereford and Gloucester, switched over to the king's side. Under the Treaty of Kingston signed in 1217, an arbitration system was agreed upon to remove all outstanding disputes between Henry and his barons. De Montfort was the initial arbiter, and the option of appealing to Louis IX was kept open. However, continued royal intrusion in the affairs of the arbitration inflamed hostility. Henry's position was further weakened when Richard de Clare passed away and his son Gilbert chose to side with the opposition. In 1263, de Montfort returned to England and gathered a council of dissidents at Oxford. 
Soon fighting broke out in the Welsh marshes, and by autumn, both sides had raised considerable armies. De Montfort decided to march on London, and the city revolted. Both the king and the queen were trapped in the Tower of London. Montfort assumed effective control, but his support soon fractured, and the king was able to gain his freedom. Now, with violence spreading, Henry appealed to Louis for arbitration. The King of France ruled in favor of Henry. He also annulled the provisions of Oxford. Some of the barons defected to the king's side, but a radical group continued to support de Montfort, who was now ready to resist any reassertion of royal power. Both groups now gathered their forces to go to war. The fighting resumed in February 1264, with attacks by Simon de Montfort's sons Henry and Simon the Younger on royalist supporters in the Welsh borders. De Montfort, who had always been against the Jews, used the cancellation of all debts owed to the Jews as a call to arms for his movement. Key allies of Montfort organized a series of attacks on the Jewish communities. The aim of these attacks was to destroy the records of debts owed to their money lenders. As a result, a majority of the Jews were killed in Worcester. This attack was led by de Montfort's son Henry and Robert Ert Ferrer. The anti-Jew movement wasn't just limited to Worcester. In London, John Fitz, one of de Montfort's key allies, killed leading Jewish figures like Isaac Phil Aaron and Cock Phil with his bare hands. The loot from the attack was shared with Montfort. As a result of these attacks, 500 Jews were killed. Simon the Younger carried out attacks in Winchester, and soon his violence spread to Lincoln and Cambridge. Jewish communities in Canterbury and Northampton were targeted by Gilbert de Clare. In April, Simon de Montfort the Elder was in control of London and assembled his army at St. Albans and marched to relieve Northampton, which was then under siege by the royal forces. But he arrived too late, and the town had already fallen as a result of betrayal. He then moved his army to Kent and laid siege to Rochester Castle, which was a royal stronghold. However, soon reports arrived that royalist forces were marching to make a move on London, so he withdrew most of his forces and turned to face a threat. However, King Henry passed over the capital and rebel army and defeated the remaining enemy forces at Rochester, after which he moved his men to capture Tunbridge in Winchelsea from the rebels. As Henry moved into Sussex, he was confronted by de Montfort, who had to take his army out of the capital and had given chase to the royalist forces. Finally, the two forces collided in what was to be called the Battle of the Loos. The baronial forces commenced the battle with a surprise dawn attack on the foragers sent out by the royalist army. The king sent his son with a cavalry charge against the enemy. The cavalry forces struck the left side of the baronial line, and the line broke, with the men fleeing to the village of Offham. Edward decided to give chase, which left the king's army exposed. Henry was forced to move his infantry and his right and center division, which walked straight towards the awaiting force. Some of the royalist forces faltered immediately, but the king's own men continued to fight until they were forced to retreat after the baron's reserve line came into the fight. The king's men were forced down the hill and into the Loos, where they fought their way back to the castle. Edward soon arrived with the cavalry, but his men were tired, and the tide of the battle had already turned into Montfort's favor. He decided to give in to the demands of renegotiations, but was captured before he could reach the royal camp. With the royal forces defeated, and both Henry and Edward captured, de Montfort forced Henry to become a figurehead king and increased parliamentary representation to include people from all parts of England. At the same time, he abolished all the taxes owed to Jews. However, his subversion to traditional systems once again fractured his support base, and in May 1265, Edward escaped custody at Hereford and raised a new royalist army at Worcester. This time, he attracted defectors from the baronial cause, and chief among them was Gilbert de Clare, one of de Montfort's most powerful allies. Simon could no longer move east, as the crossing of the River Severn was now under royalist control, 
which was completed by Edward's capture of Gloucester. De Montfort moved into Wales and asked the Welsh Prince Lun ap Gruffydd for support. He was provided with soldiers, but in an attempt to ship his forces across the Severn was stopped when his transports were destroyed by royalist warships and he was forced to return to Hereford. Now the royalists were on the offensive. Prince Edward attacked Montfort's seat at Kenilworth Castle. Simon the Younger and his forces were caught asleep in the camp by royalist forces who attacked in the early hours of the day. Hundreds were massacred, and the survivors took refuge in the castle. As a result, Edward was forced to lay siege. The move of royalist forces to Kenilworth allowed Simon the Elder the chance to cross the Severn and move his forces to help his son, but his army was intercepted and decisively defeated at the Battle of Evesham. Simon and his son Henry were both killed in the fighting, and King Henry, whom Simon had taken into battle, was freed. This victory allowed the royal forces to take the dominant position, but despite de Montfort's death, some of the rebel forces continued to defend their position. Most notable among them was Kenilworth Castle. The war continued to drag on, but in 1299, King Henry was persuaded to seek a compromise settlement and a commission of bishops and barons drafted a proclamation known as the Dictum of Kenilworth. According to this agreement, the rebels would be able to secure a pardon and regain their confiscated land only after they had paid a heavy fine. This proposal was initially rejected, but some time later, food supplies ran out and hunger compelled the defenders of Kenilworth to surrender and accept the terms of dictum. In the following years, Gilbert de Clare once again revolted and tried to occupy London, but he was soon reconciled with Henry by a negotiated settlement in June, which eased the terms of the dictum and enabled the repentant rebels to regain their lands before rather than after paying their fines. The same year, the negotiated surrender of the last group of defiant rebels who had been holding out in the fens at the Isle of Ely was also achieved. The war had a heavy death toll, and almost 15,000 men lost their lives. The provision of Oxford was never again used by the barons as ground for civil war, at least for the next 350 years. They would instead depose weak and ineffective kings like Edward II, Richard II, and Henry VI, rather than attempting to regulate their powers by charters. However, the Magna Carta and provisions of Oxford created the concept of a monarchy whose powers were not absolute. The idea of a representative parliament had been inculcated into the English society, and in 1272 Edward I called such a gathering at his accession to the throne. As time progressed, these became more and more common, ultimately leading to the birth of the House of Commons in the 14th century. So that's all the time we had today, folks. Hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to subscribe to view more of our amazing videos. Oh, and do hit the bell icon to remain updated about all our future videos. See you next time, folks. Adios.